Per week. We were getting ready to do what? Huh? We had the rapture already. Yeah. Yeah. In God's eternal purpose, we had the rapture. And we had a rapture, and it was an Old Testament incident related to the rapture, wasn't there? What was the Old Testament incident related to the rapture? The flood. Noah had prepared the flood. God opened the door, let everybody in the flood, in the ark, and then shut the door. God shut the door, and that's a type of the rapture. And outside of that was judgment, and outside of the rapture is judgment again. But people were saved outside of that ark, as people are going to be saved during the tribulation period after, after the rapture. There's so many people that I've talked to, <clears throat> those in other different religions, especially in charismatic churches, and boy, it's, they're liable to come up with any kind of an idea, really. <clears throat> it just, it's really hard. But, uh, I had one guy talk to me one time, uh, a people that I really loved very much, they were in the charismatic movement. I took my dad there before he died. He wanted to go there. And uh, he came in, and I had just published my doctor's thesis on the book of Revelation. He said, I don't think there's anybody going to be saved during the tribulation period. And I said, well, the Bible says that there's a number of people without number that's going to be saved during the tribulation period. And he said, where did you say that? And I said, in the book of Revelation. So I read it to him. And uh, he, uh, well, I didn't know that. Well, they have their ideas outside of the Bible. See, they have so much personal revelation that, that they don't depend upon the Bible to understand what they know. I mean, that what they know and what the Bible teaches so many times is totally different. Totally different. The world today is a world of uh, materialism. And the Bible is a pretty much non-materialistic book in, in all reality. What did Jesus have when he was on this earth? He owned the whole universe, but what did he have? Not a place to, to lay his head. Huh. And he said, you're going to be just, you want to be like me? Be like that also. And I tell you what, there's not very many preachers willing to do that, not to have a place to lay their head. I've known some that did. Well, after the rapture, the tribulation comes upon the earth. The beast, the false prophet, the antichrist, this unholy trinity. Now, as I was saying earlier, those that have come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and have left the Islamic world, always, they, the Islam, everything that's good in the Bible is bad in Islam. Everything that's good in the Islam is bad in the Bible. And they just emphasize this in their, in their eschatology. And it may be right. Who knows? We know that there's going to be an Antichrist coming, that he's going to be born of Satan, that he's going to utter blasphemous things. What could be more blasphemous, they say, than to say, Allah is the only God, and only God that has no companion, no Jesus, no Son. What could be more blasphemous than that in a religion? That Jesus Christ was not born into this world as the Son of God, that he was nothing but a, a so-called prophet, that he didn't die on the cross of Calvary, that he didn't re wasn't resurrected from the dead, that does away with all the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15 chapter, that Jesus Christ came according to the scriptures, that he died according to the scriptures, that he was raised according to the scriptures. And that he is the God of heaven, the, the creator, John 1 chapter. I used to go out, and there was a place in Taft, California, there was a Muslim guy that owned this frosty freeze out there, and I'd go out there, and I'd, I'd be writing Greek and stuff all the time, and he'd say, the Bible's corrupted, the Bible's corrupted. I didn't say much to him, but I'd just say, this is what it says here. Well, the Bible's corrupted, you can't believe it, the Bible's corrupted. The Bible is corrupted, it's called the Quran. The Quran is a corruption of the Bible. And you see all of this, there is nothing more than adamantly corrupt and adamantly anti-Christian than 
the Quranic teachings. So is this part of the Antichrist? It could be part of the Antichrist uh, philosophy, surely. And 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 13 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus, and that means only in their bodies, not spirit and not soul. Man is triune. He's made in the image of God, 1 Corinthians, or not 1 Corinthians, but Genesis 1 and verse 26. It's for it said, God said, let us make man in our image. It means our spiritual image, our our." Uh, shadow casting image and then it says in our blood flowing likeness as he would as Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate form was so he made man and in his sovereign likeness he made man man was supposed to protect the earth guard it he didn't he had the ability to do it but he didn't do it we come all the way down and now we have the first Adam, and then we have the first Adam, second Adam, Jesus Christ, and now we have a perversion of the Christ, of the Christ, of the Bible. There's, the Christ of the Bible came to, literally, to atone for us. He came to atone for us. All other religions have use of having to do something to atone for your sins. God atoned for our sins. Now, during the tribulation period, this gospel is going to be preached. We have angels preaching, flying through heaven, preaching the everlasting gospel. We have the two witnesses stand up and preach the gospel. And in the city of Jerusalem is where that happens. And then they're killed. They're murdered by the Antichrist. He kills them. He kills God's witnesses. And then they lay down, and they got cameras on them, and they're broadcasting this all over the world, and the whole world sees them dead. Now, in 1860, that couldn't have happened. In 1900, that couldn't have happened. But in 1960, it could happen. And in 2013, it definitely could happen. Huh? Can you take a photograph and broadcast it all over the world? Yes. And they do that. And in Jerusalem, they're going to, these, these uh, prophets are going to be killed, and they're going to lay there unburied for three days. Like Jesus, you know, three days, dead, and all of a sudden, they're going to stand up again. And they won't be able to be killed the next second time. They won't be able to get killed. Well, Israel now, in the middle of the week, the Lord said in his word, when you see the abomination desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel take place in the temple, and that's when the, the Christ, the so-called Christ, but that is the Antichrist, stands up and said, I am God. And when he does that, know that the end is near. And so Israel is supposed to be taken off. And Israel is going to take off and they're going to hide in the hiding place. Many people believe the hiding place is Petra. And they're going to be there for three and a half years, and God's going to protect them. The Antichrist is going to send armies after them. Great floods of armies. The battlefield is going to be 200 miles long, and in that battlefield there's going to be people killed, and blood is going to flow this deep in places in that battlefield. Blood is going to flow that deep. Finally, at the end of it, Jesus Christ is going to appear in heaven. This is at the end of the tribulation period. And he's going to bring with him. Now let's turn to the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 19. Starting with verse number 11. I have read, written, I read from this so many times. I ought to just, my Bible ought to just open up to it. 19 verse 11, and actually it did. The coming of Christ, Psalm 24, 1 through 10, Psalm 74, 2, 1 through 20, Isaiah 2 and 1 through 4, and 11, 5 through 10, 
2 Samuel 7, 14 through 17, Daniel 2, 44 through 45, Isaiah 36 and verse 1. And I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and Righteousness he judges and wages war in righteousness. Wars basically aren't righteous at all. You go back into America, in the American Civil War, and you look what happened, how the North won the war. They broke all the rules of war that you would say today. They were, they were bringing war upon civilians. Sherman went through his march to the sea where he made Georgia howl. He burned down every house, burned every field, killed all their dogs, all their cattle, all their pigs, all their sheep. Whatever they had, if it was alive, he had killed it. Raped and pillaged all the way across the South. And they talk about Bloody Bill Fontrell and all of that. It was nothing compared to what Sherman did and what Grant did to his own men. But that's how they chose to win the war, outside the rules of war. Now here, this war is waged in righteousness. And I saw heaven open up in a white horse, and who sat upon him, faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. He judges in righteousness and he wages war. And why is Jesus going to be the judge, by the way? Way over here. Over here at the white throne. We're going to go into a thousand year reign before this, but way over here. Why is Jesus the, the judge? Because God became flesh and he lived in flesh like we live in flesh. And his eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. The diadem is diadema in Greek, and there's the word stephanos in Greek. A stephanos is a crown that you win by birth. Jesus really, he had a stephanos and diadems. Both. Because he won that crown by birth, because he was the king of the earth, the heavens and the earth, when he was born in the world. But he conquered Satan in every avenue while he was on this earth. The diadems are the stages of war, of the battles that he won. The diadems. On his head are many diadems. And he had a name written upon whom which no man knows except himself. And this is how do you pronounce the name Jehovah. The word Jehovah, we don't know how to say that. We, I say that, but that's what King James translated it. It's not, we don't have any way to pronounce that word, to tell you the truth. The Jews were so afraid to use the name in vain, they just say Hadabar, or Hashem, or Adonai now. They don't try to say the word Jehovah. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Now, I had one of my students call me the other day, and he was talking about uh, the word baptizo. And he asked me, uh, you told me a long time ago there was a, a verse in the Bible that was translated correctly, correctly by King James men, but all the rest of it wasn't. They, weren't, they wouldn't translate the word baptize, and they just put the word baptize down there because it means dipped. And here's the word baptized right here. And this is the other place that he talked to me about, Brett, if you're listening. And he is clothed with a robe dipped, baptized in blood. And his name is called the Word of, love, of God. Ho Logos to Theu. The Word of God. The Word. That's the word Jehovah there. The word, the, what we call the Hebraism, translating it, the word Hathabar into Ho Logos, in the Greek language, that's a Hebraism. That's the name for Jehovah. He's called the Jehovah of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. And these are the tribulation, pre-tribulation saints. The pre-tribulation saints, the, those that were with him. They're not coming to fight, but they're coming to see their master, their, their husband. The bride is following the husband to see him in battle. 
and all of these are on the same horses. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads out the winepress of the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty. Almighty, El Shaddai, the Almighty God, El Shaddai. That's one of the titles of Jesus. That's one of the titles of Jehovah. And not only is robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, Athenai Ha'anaim, Lord of Lord and King of Kings. That's the title of Jehovah also. That's the title that, that Jesus had, and that's the title he has here. And I saw angels standing in the sun, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, Come and assemble for the great supper of God. The Lord is going to go there and he's going to slay all these people in this great big giant battlefield. And the birds of heaven, now if you go down to Fish Lake Valley and look, look carefully, especially down by the court ramp, you're going to see a few vultures. We saw some the other day, didn't we, Marilyn? Mm -hmm. Some vultures down there. And out there where we lived in Old River, there's a place down there called Vulture's Roost, or what I call Vulture's Roost. There's a great big old uh, uh, eucalyptus grove, and there was probably 100 to maybe 500 vultures would migrate in there at a time. And the Lord is saying, come here, it's dinner time. Come and get it, or I throw it out and spit in the skillet, as the old uh, cowboy cook said. Come on, it's time to eat. And I saw an angel standing in the sun. That's this is in the sky, okay. It's come assembled for the great supper of God, in order that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves and small and great. This, this army of the Antichrist is going to have slaves. Guess what? Think, put your thinking hats on. Who is, what is the only nation under heaven today that has slaves? <clears throat> what is the only nation under heaven today that has slaves? Islam. Islam. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Now I'm going to tell you something, Jesus is going to protect his army. One man said one time, he said if presidents had to be the leading general leading into the battle, we'd have very few battles. But now Jesus is going to lead out in battle, and he's going to be doing the one that he's... That the other troops are there just for watching. The Colbert Pocket in France. Audie Leon Murphy. Had his men go and, and stand back. They had, I believe it was eight German tanks coming, and 250 men coming and his men had been greatly reduced and all the artillery and everybody, the people using the artillery, the anti-tank guns and everything, they were dead. And he got out there himself and with a field phone and he called any aircraft and, and uh, mortar shells and shells in on his own position because they were so close. They said, how close are they? And he said, hold on a minute, I'll let you talk to one of them. <laughs> Bravely, he stood on that tank destroyer with a 50-gallon machine gun and stopped those tanks and killed most of those 250 soldiers by himself. His men were behind him, behind him. And one of the shells hit the tank. One of the shells that he called upon himself hit the tank. And he fell off the tank unconscious. He had shrapnel all through his body. He'd already had his hip shot off one time. He, he was, uh, as a sniper, uh, 
he was after this sniper, and the sniper shot him in the hip. And he was laying down on the ground, and he put his helmet down there, out there, and the, the sniper came out and aimed and shot at his hat. When he did that, he shot the sniper in the head. He had been shot in the hip by that sniper, and they had to carry him. And he went on up there, and he captured the whole group. They just sat back and watched him. They were dumbfounded. When he, he had already been shot, he got the Congressional Medal of Honor for what he did here at the Comar Pocket, Pocket in France. When he stopped all those men, stood off 250 men, one man, on that tank with that 50 caliber machine gun. And then he did, he wrote a book called To Hell and Back. And he was starring in the movie, and in the movie that machine gun kept, he was firing blanks, but he kept on misfiring. And they asked him, boy, this is, this is, this is a pain in the neck. He said, I'll tell you what, if that machine gun that I was using there and the Colmar Poffitt had misfired, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here. But I said all that to say this, Jesus is the one out fighting. It's not you and me. Jesus is fighting for him. He's the warrior king that goes out. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Adonai Adonaiim. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth. The beast. Now, the, uh, the Quran and the Sunnahs and the Hadith and the Hadith, they talk about a, uh, a beast and the false prophet they talk about beast and the prophet. And they talk about Issa. Now the Jesus of Islam is not the Jesus of the Bible at all. Period. Zero. They're not the same one at all. But they have a false prophet. They have the Mahdi. And they have Issa. And this beast has got the head of a ram the eyes of a pig, the neck of a giraffe, the legs of a camel, the tail of a ram, and the body of a lion. You know, they had some pretty good imagination. I think they read the book of Daniel. That's a weird looking beast. And by the way, it's 20 feet between joints and his leg. It's this big animal. But this animal is going to go out and mark all of the true followers with the mark of the beast of the true followers of Islam. That's their, what we call eschatology. Everything in the Bible that is good is bad in the Quran and the writings. Everything that's good in the Quran is bad in the Bible. The beast is a bad person in the Bible, isn't it? Don't take the, the mark of the beast. You take the mark of the beast, you're damned forever. But all the Muslims want the mark of the beast. <coughs> I'll tell you something. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet, who performed the signs, and in his presence. Now the devil can do signs and wonders, I'm telling you that right now. He did that in the, in the, uh, the book of Exodus. And he'll do it again in the tribulation period. Perform the signs in his presence which deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns for brimstone with brimstone. The lake of fire was created all the way back in eternity past for the fallen angels. Nobody else at that time. But as, as we see progressively revelated in the Bible, the others are going to go there. But there's also a place called Sheol. Sheol. Now the, boat, the, the, the lake of fire, or Gehenna, spoken of in other places of fire in the Bible, is not Sheol. Sheol is a place that all lost people have gone before Christ and after Christ. It's not purgatory, but it is a place of punishment. It is a place where people suffer in torments, plural, 
until they are resurrected in real bodies. Now, in Sheol, people are only suffering in their soul and spirits, but they have a sort of visible body of some sort, somehow. I don't understand all about that. But we know that they that the lost people that go to Sheol, they looked over before the Lord's resurrection and they looked over there and they recognized Abraham and all of this and they were repenting and, and wanting people to go back and tell their family not to come to this place. But that place will be emptied one of these days. It's going to be emptied at the Greek white throne judgment. Now, we come here to the end of the tribulation period, and now we're going to have Jesus on the horse. Jesus is going to set up the throne. Many believe that the resurrected David will be ruling uh, from Jerusalem on the earth, and Jesus in heaven with his bride. Now remember, the bride of Christ is not all the saved, as many people believe. There are many people in heaven that are not part of the bride. And many people say, well, everybody that's saved in the Old Testament, everybody that's saved in the New Testament is part of the bride. That's not true. The bride is made up of faithful members of God's New Testament churches. There are many people saved outside of churches. Many people saved that know the Lord, that have repented, and, and believe that Jesus Christ uh, is the, God the Son and Savior but they never have linked up with the New Testament church. They do not have scriptural baptism. They, they have never taken the Lord's Supper one time in those churches, not New Testament churches. And they will be in the family of God. But the churches are the bride of Christ. They are in close proximity with Him because they have laid it all aside for Him. That's a reward. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is a state of being. When you've been born again, when you've been saved, you are saved and you you are in the family of God, period. Never to get, get you thrown out of the family of God. The beast was seized and with him the false prophet performed the signs and presence which he deceived and those have been received the mark of the beast and those who had worshipped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Those are the first inhabitants in hellfire. They're the first inhabitants in eternal hellfire. Nobody else is there yet. They're all in Sheol. And the rest were killed with the sword and came from the mouth of him and sat upon the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Jesus must like these buzzards. He's given them plenty of food. 20th chapter of the book of Revelation now. Now, we're going into the millennial reign. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss. The abyss means no bottom. Abiso. Abiso. Abiso means bottom. Abiso means no bottom. In Greek. And the key of the no bottom and the chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, the dragon, Dracona and the serpent of old, who is the devil, and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. Now for 1,000 years, Satan is not going to be on this earth. There are people today that think that we're in the millennium. Uh, Satan is not bound, and he's not in the bottom of the pit, and there is sin on the earth today. Oh, and they say, oh, well, it's just a spiritual. God's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It has nothing to do with this world. This kingdom is a real kingdom, Epitaes Gais, El Haaretz. It's upon the earth. It's real. And he's going to get Satan and he's going to take him and all of his cohorts and not any of them are going to be allowed to influence anybody in the world. And why is the reason for the millennial reign? What's the reason for the millennial reign? To show mankind he's going to be bad without the devil. The devil didn't make you do it. Would Adam and Eve have sinned without the devil? Would they? Would they have sinned without the devil? Did the devil really make her do it? And then, man, and then man, Adam says, Well, the woman that you gave to me, she gave to me and I ate. The woman that you gave to me, she kept on giving me and I kept on eating. For 1,000 years, 
And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed after after these things, meditate, he must be released a short time. Now, that's not the last thing we're going to see of Satan. We got more to go yet. More to go yet. Our Father, we thank you for your message and for your word. Thank you for all the blessings you give us. Thank you for this. Thank you that we can know what's happening in the future. Thank you that we may not be deceived by the, by the deceptive prophets of the world, but only convinced by your word as we look at it and know that is truth. Please forgive me where I fell again. In Jesus' name I pray.